Um, I call the meeting to order. Uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon if you are here in Geneva and greetings to those who are in different parts of the world. Uh, to, today we are in day three of our, of our program for, for, for the week. And this afternoon is reserved for the working group on uh, transparency and reporting. They have an agenda in place that would uh, guide the discussions this, this afternoon. But before I hand over to the two co-chairs of the working group, I would want to just remind you again of uh, the standard working rules for, for our meeting. Of course, uh, the first one being about interpretation, it remains in place in all languages. And secondly, the speaker's list is, has not been prepared in advance. I will be taking um, speakers as they request for the flow, either through raising their name plate or by uh, sending uh, their request via the chat function. The other interesting uh, announcement to make is that we are, as a secretariat, as we have done in the past, we, the proceedings here are recorded. So the recordings of uh, the first day and possibly the second day are already available on the website for your access. So if you go to our website, you can have an access of uh, the proceedings uh, of uh, the first and, uh, and, and the second day. And lastly, we request uh, uh, speakers who are in a position to do so to provide us with uh, their written statements uh, so that they can be uploaded on the ATT website. Of course, we are not insisting on that, but if you have a written statement that you'd want to see uploaded on the ATT website for, for information, please do so by sending it to the info address of the ATT Secretariat so that it can be uploaded. I take this opportunity then at this point to hand over to the co-chairs of the working group. They are newly minted. Uh, the two co-chairs uh, were appointed by the president for CSP8 cycle. Uh, the first, to, just to introduce them, one is Madam or Sabine, Madam uh, Sabine Fisa from the Netherlands, as well as um, Grisel Rodriguez from the Panama. So they're the new co-chairs of the working group on transparency and reporting. I have the pleasure then to hand over to them to facilitate uh, today's uh, discussions. Thank you so much, over to you. Thank you, Dean Sami. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us in the meeting of the ATT Working Group on Transparency and Reporting. My name is Sabine Fisser from the MFA of the Netherlands and together with my co-chair, Ms. Grisel Rodriguez from the Permanent mission of Panama and Geneva. I have the honor to co-chair this meeting today. At this point, we would like to thank the previous co-chairs of the working group, Ms. Yulia Vladescu of Romania, and Mr. Alejandro Alba Vernendez of Mexico for their diligence and successful efforts in advancing the work of the working group. We would also like to express our gratitude to the president for organizing this meeting and to the ATT secretariat for its indispensable support in the run-up of this meeting. We will open the meeting with the adoption of the agenda. The draft annotated agenda was circulated on the 31st of January together with an introductory paper. The co-chairs would like to remind participants that during the CSP7, states parties endorsed a number of standing agenda items and recurring and specific tasks for the working group for the period between CSP7 and CSP8. The standing agenda items that states parties instructed the working group to deal with as a minimum are the following six items. First, state of play of compliance with reporting obligation. Second, challenges concerning reporting. Third, substantive reporting and transparency issues. Fourth, organizational means for information exchange. Fifth, IT platform reporting and transparency functionalities. And six, the working group for transparency and reporting mandate in the period between CSP 8 and CSP 9. 
In light of the reduced time allocated to this meeting due to the hybrid format, the co-chairs have adapted the agenda to ensure that enough time is allocated for each topic and to allow for sufficient discussion. Topics that have been omitted from the agenda can still be addressed in writing or be, proposed, be postponed to the next preparatory meeting in the CSB 8 cycle. The co-chairs encourage participants to submit any proposals via the email or via the information exchange platform. The co-chairs would at this point like to ask participants if they have any remarks about the draft annotated agenda or if they, or if they want to propose any additional agenda items under AOB. If so, please take the floor. I don't see any delegates asking for the floor. No, then I conclude that the agenda is adopted. We will address the agenda points in the order listed and look forward to a constructive, interactive, and lively debate during the meeting. With that, we move to the first agenda item, the state of play of compliance with reporting obligation. In every meeting, the working group reviews the status of reporting. To this end, the ATT Secretariat will give a presentation with a general overview of the reporting status and of the progress that has been made in comparison to the previous status update. So without further ado, I pass the floor to Ms. Sarah Parker of the ATT Secretariat. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the co-chairs for the invitation to give an overview of the current status of ATT reporting. Um, can I just grab the clicker before I go any further? Thank you. As you will all recall, Article 13.1 of the treaty requires each state party to submit an initial report on its implementation of the treaty within one year of the treaty entering into force. In addition, Article 13.3 requires states parties to submit an annual report on their imports and exports. I'm going to start with initial reports, giving both a global overview as well as a regional breakdown. I will then do the same with annual reports, giving the global picture and again a regional breakdown. So starting with initial reports, to date we have 110 states parties and all of them should have submitted an initial report by now, that is 100% of states parties. In fact, 84 states parties have done so. So this means that 76% of states parties that were due to report have done so. Uh, this means we've received three new initial reports since August last year, when I gave an update during the seventh conference of states parties. But the number of states parties that should have submitted a report has also obviously gone up. Uh, there are 26 states parties that should have submitted their initial report by now and have not yet done so. That is 24%. On the next slide, we've provided some additional information on initial reports. As you will recall, states parties do have the option to request that their initial report not be made public. 20 states have requested that their initial reports not be made public. That is 24% of initial reports that have been submitted. In August last year, that figure was 21%. 17 states had restricted their initial reports. So these reports are available to states parties on the restricted area of the website only. We've also indicated whether initial reports were submitted on time. With respect to initial reports we've received so far, 42 of them were received on time or before they were due, that is 50%. Finally, a total of 71 states that submitted their initial reports, that is 85%, used the reporting template in their submissions. Article 13 also stipulates that states parties shall report on any new measures undertaken to implement the treaty when this is appropriate. So far, six states have submitted updated initial reports. And I'm pleased to report that the state party that submitted an updated initial report most recently, last week, in fact, used the revised reporting template that was adopted by CSP7. I'm now going to look at reporting at the regional level. In this slide, we have an overview of participation in the reporting process by region. We based the regional classification on the UN Statistics Division classification system. 
The green colour, of course, indicates states' parties in the region that were due to report and have done so, and the red indicates states' parties in the region that were due to report, submit an initial report, and have not done so. So if we look at Africa at the top, on the top row, we see that there are 14 states' parties that should have submitted an initial report and have done so, and there are 14 states' parties that should, should have submitted an initial report by now and have not yet done so. With respect to the Americas, the next row, we see that there are 19 states' parties that should have submitted an initial report and have done so, and there are eight states' parties that should have submitted an initial report and have not yet done so, and so on. Moving on now to annual reports. This slide gives us an, a summary of how many annual reports were due, submitted, not submitted, not made public, and submitted on time for all of the reporting years so far. So that is 2015 to 2020. So column one indicates the year that we're referring to. Column two tells us how many annual reports were due each year. So in 2015, 61 annual reports were due. In 2016, 75 annual reports were due and so on. As the number of states parties has grown, so has the number of states that must submit annual reports, obviously. Column three tells us how many annual reports were submitted each year in terms of the actual number as well as the percentage of reports due that year, and this is the figure in brackets. So for 2015, we see that 51 annual reports were submitted, and this was 84% of the annual reports due that year. The fourth column indicates how many states parties submitted a report even though they were not yet required to do so. These have not been factored into the percentages, but they are just there for your information. Column five tells us how many states parties were supposed to submit an annual report in a given year but did not do so. And column six indicates how many states requested their annual report be made available to states parties only. And we can see this has risen from two reports in 2015, or 4%, to 19 reports, or 31% in 2020. With respect to timeliness, states' parties are due to submit their annual reports by the 31st of May each year. We see a lot of states' parties submitting their reports two or three days after the deadline, so we give a little bit of a grace period here, and we treat anyone who reports within seven days of the deadline as having submitted on time. And the final column gives an indication of how many states parties submitted their annual reports on time each year. Now, just in terms of the use of the reporting tool, for 2020, 12 states used the online reporting tool to submit their annual report. Six uploaded their report to the online system, meaning they submitted a PDF of their report and uploaded it to the system, but they didn't use the online tool itself and three submitted their UN Register report, UNROCA. The chart on the next slide gives a summary of how many reports were and were not submitted. So we can conclude or summarize that a higher percentage of states parties fulfilled their obligation to submit annual reports for 2015. But we should also keep in mind, of course, that there were fewer states parties at that time with an obligation to report. And the next slide shows these figures in terms of actual numbers. So you can see from this that more states reported in 2020, there are 61 states, versus 2015, where 51 states reported. But more states were due to report, of course, because there are more states parties to the treaty with a reporting obligation now. Uh, now we're going to take a brief look at reporting, annual reporting by region. This chart shows us percentage of states parties in each region that should have submitted annual reports each year and did so by region and by year. So for instance, the first set of columns shows reporting by states parties in Africa. The dark blue column tells us that 71% of states parties in Africa that should have reported in 2015 did so. The yellow column tells us that 46% did so in 2016. The orange column tells us 29% did in 2017, and so on. Um, and you can see the yearly rates of reporting for each region as you move across the chart. On a final note, we've also prepared a slide that gives an indication of how many states' parties have submitted all of the annual reports that they were due to submit over the years. So in this pie chart, the green segment tells us that 55 states parties, which is 52%, 
the state's parties due to submit an, an annual report, have submitted an annual report every year that they were supposed to do so. So if they were supposed to have submitted six reports by now, they've submitted six annual reports. If they were required to have submitted two annual reports by now, they've submitted two, and so on. So they fulfilled all their annual reporting obligations, 100% in full. The yellow segment tells us that 20 states parties, or 19% of states due to submit an annual report, submitted at least one annual report, but not all of the annual reports that they were required to submit over the years. So maybe they should have submitted five annual reports by now, and they've only submitted three. Or maybe they have submitted, so they have two outstanding reports, sorry. Um, and the red segment, finally, tells us that there are 30 states parties, or 29% of states parties due to submit an annual report, that have never submitted an annual report. So maybe they should have submitted five by now, or two, but they have submitted zero. Now, what is the purpose of this analysis? Well, as part of the outreach that the ATT Secretariat intends to take with respect to reporting, we feel that it's important to distinguish between those states parties that have submitted at least some reports that were due and those that have never submitted an annual report. If a state party has managed to submit one or two annual reports, but not all of them, then you're likely to ask them different questions as to why they've not fulfilled all of their reporting obligations. Or perhaps more importantly, they will probably have different answers to the question, why have you not submitted all of your annual reports? Obviously, at some point, the state had the information and the data required, they had the interagency cooperation needed to prepare and submit a report or more than one report. Maybe it's a single person was in charge and he or she left their post and no one has taken over that task. Um, a state that has never submitted an annual report, though, may be facing very different challenges. Maybe they're not even aware that they have to submit an annual report in the first place. So when we target these different groups to determine why they have not submitted all their annual reports or any of their annual reports, we will be asking different questions and presumably dealing with different challenges that states parties face. So we've included this slide to illustrate how we plan to approach partial and non-reporting states as part of our outreach to improve reporting. And with that, I thank the co-chairs once again. And of course, um, as with all the Secretariat's presentations, we will be making these slides available on the website so you can take a longer look. Thank you. Many thanks to you, Sarah, for this most informative presentation, as well as for the Secretariat's continued work on managing the reporting under the ATT. The co-chairs are happy to note there have been some improvements, such as the updates on in, in initial reporting and more timely reporting, but are also concerned about the continued downward trend in the level of reporting under the ATT. Uh, with that, I would like to open the floor to participants who wish to share their view on the status of reporting. I see there have, has been a request for the floor by Map for Peace. Uh, I give you the floor. مؤثره شكرا لاتاحه الفرصه لمسيح جماعه السلام والتنميه وحقوق الانسان بالمشاركه في تلك المناقشه العامه المتعلقه بالشفافيه واعداد التقارير شكرا للفريق العامل على اعداد المسود شعور مؤسسه معد بالقلق باستمرار المشاركات القليله في اعداد التقارير وتقديمها للامانه العامه حيث اشار الفريق العامل للمادتين 6 و7 المتعلقه بالاعمال المحظوره والتصدير ان هناك 20 دوله فقط وثلاث منظمات مجتمع مدني قدموا ملاحظاتهم وتقاريرهم الى الامانه وفقا لما هو منشور على موقع الامانه العامه من بيانات متعلقه بتقديم الدول لتقاريرها السنويه فالنسبه ضعيفه جدا مقارنه باعداد الدول المنضمه الى المعاهده. حيث بين 2015 إلى 2020 نرى أن نسبة التقارير السنوية المستحقة والمستلمة في تراجع عن السنوات السابقة وأن هناك تزايد نسبي في التقارير المستحقة ولكن لم يتم استلامها وأيضا الدول التي لم تقدم تقاريرها منذ 2015 مثل أفغانستان ونيجيريا لذلك تتساءل مؤسسة السماعات عن السبب الذي لم يجعل الدول في تفاعل مع الأمانة العامة هل ذلك لأسباب متعلقة بالآلية المتخذة لتقديم التقارير؟ تعتقد مؤسسة معت أنه أصبح هناك حاجة لإشراك منظمات المجتمع في عملية إعداد التقارير الوطنية للدول 
حيث وفقا لما تم الاشاره اليه مكتب الامانه العامه حول عمليه التصديق وانضمام الدول الجديده الى معاهده محفزه لاعاده النظر في الاليه المستخدمه لاعداد التقارير لذلك وتقترح مؤسسة ماعد أيضا أن يكون هناك آليات استعراض حيث أن عملية استعراض الدول لملفها الوطني فيما يتعلق بالتزامها بمعاهدة تجارة الأسلحة أصبحت عملية مهمة لتحقيق هدف المعاهدة حيث تضمن مراجعة الدول بشكل دوري وهذا بجانب تشكيل فريق خبراء يقوم بمراجعة التقارير الوطنية المقدمة من قبل الدول في تواريخ محددة كما نؤكد على ضرورة بناء قدرات المجتمع المدني وتشجيعهم لتقديم تقاريرهم إلى الأمانة العامة لأن هذا سوف يضمن التنفيذ الفعال للاتفاقية وتحقيق أهدافها شكرا Uh, thank you, Mark, for peace. I would like to request the future delegates to um, speak a little bit more slowly uh, for their interpreters. Uh, I see that the EU has raised its flag. I give you the floor. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and congratulations to both you and Madam Rodriguez for their appointment as co-chairs of this working group. Uh, Madam Co-Chairs, I have the honor to speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states, the candidate countries, the Republic of North Macedonia, Montenegro and Alban Albania, and the EFTA countries, Iceland and Norway, uh, as well as Georgia, align themselves with this statement. The EU supports the principles of cooperation, responsibility and transparency in the international arms trade en enshrined in the Arms Trade Treaty. Transparency and reporting are key elements leading to confidence building amongst st states and enabling accountability and scrutiny for arms export decisions uh, taken by national authorities. Reporting on arms exports and imports represents one of the cornerstone obligations of the ATT. We therefore reiterate our call on all states parties to fulfill their reporting obligations in a timely and transparent manner, and transparent means publicly available. Without public reporting, states parties undermine the effectiveness of the treaty, and we regret, therefore, the fact that China has decided not to make its initial report under the ATT publicly available. We call on China to reconsider this decision in the spirit of the ATT. The long trend of decreasing reporting rates is highly regrettable and alarming. We hope to see better figures uh, and would like to take the opportunity to draw attention to the upcoming deadline for submitting the annual report for 2021. We commend all states parties that have already filled in their annual reports for 2021 and encourage others to follow suit in a timely manner and to share their reports publicly. There are many reasons for the current low reporting rate, including a lack of capacity and, and, and resources, international coordination challenges, and difficulties in conducting technical assessments. While it is important to discuss these challenges and find practical ways to overcome them, reporting is and remains a fundamental obligation for states parties that must be adhered to. The EU stands ready to assist and in, in this regard, we recall that the EU ATT outreach program has entered into a third phase. Also, the EU supports the ATT secretariat in, in, assist, in assisting states parties in need. And then, there, of course, there's the voluntary trust fund for this purpose as well. The EU adopted its 23rd annual report on arms exports on 28 September 2021, informing in detail on arms sales authorized by EU member states in the last year, or in the previous last year, 2020. It is the fastest annual report release until uh, date, up to date, uh, within nine months of the end of the reporting year. On top of that, the EES has, the European External Action Service has launched a searchable online database containing the annual arms export data of all member states since 2013. Later on today, I will give a more detailed presentation on that, so I will not go into detail in this statement, but you'll hear more about this database uh, under the last agenda item at the request of the co-chairs. Um, Finally, we reaffirm our commitment to transparency in international arms trade, and in this regard, we have taken a number of concrete measures in order to facilitate correct, coherent, and timely reporting on member states' arms exports. 
we call on all states parties to opt for public reporting, which clearly increases the relevance of the reports and facilitates accountability for export decisions. We are grateful, finally, to the ATT Secretariat for their continued updates on the number of initial, initial and annual reports, which help us tr track progress. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairs. Thank you to the delegate of the European Union. Cameroon, you have the floor. Merci de me donner la parole au nom de la délégation du Cameroun. Je saisis cette occasion pour remercier les co-présidentes du groupe de travail sur la transparence et la soumission des rapports pour les efforts consentis. La densité des documents préparés le justifie à suffisance. Euh, je salue également le choix qui a été fait de mettre deux femmes à la coordination de ce groupe de travail. S'agissant de la question objet des présentes discussions, le Cameroun voudrait relever qu'il accorde une grande importance à la question de la transparence. Il le démontre à travers la soumission régulière de ces rapports en effet, mon pays a effectivement déposé son rapport initial ainsi que les rapports annuels de 2019 et 2020. Il faut dire que ces deux rapports annuels ont été déposés en une seule fois au cours de l'année 2021. Euh, Lorsqu'on consulte le site du TCA, l'on note uniquement le dépôt du rapport 2020, si je ne me trompe pas. Le Cameroun saurait gré au secrétariat des dispositions qu'il voudrait bien prendre afin de procéder au réajustement des données indiquant que les rapports 2019 et 2020 ont été effectivement déposés. Ceci pour dire que le Cameroun est à jour de ses obligations en lien avec l'article 13.3 du TCA. Le choix fait de soumettre deux rapports à la fois a, est dû au retard à accuser dans la collecte des données. Ceci est une véritable contrainte dans le contexte actuel de la préparation du rapport annuel au Cameroun. Toutes les institutions concernées sont mises à contribution et le ministère des Relations extérieures coordonne le tout. La méthode sera affinée avec certitude, avec le temps, à la faveur des échanges comme ceci. Aussi, pour faciliter l'utilisation du modèle de rapport produit par le présent groupe de travail, le Cameroun suggère que soit extrait du document question-réponse sur l'établissement des rapports et inscrit dans un document unique les éléments d'explication pouvant servir de guide à l'utilisation du modèle suggéré. Ce serait aussi l'occasion d'expliquer la plus-value du modèle révisé. Cette option pourrait aider à une plus grande utilisation du dit modèle par les États partis quand on sait que plus d'un utilise des modèles librement choisis. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Cameroon, for your intervention. Uh, we would also like to ask all delegations to send in their submission in writing, if that is possible. Uh, the following delegations have asked for the floor, China, Switzerland, and Control Arms. I will give you uh, the floor. Uh, China, you have the floor. <coughs> Shi 一直积极向联合国常委武器登记册提交报告 Hajiang 
各主管部门和专家起草报告，提供了便利。中方对此表示赞赏。中方注意到，条约在提高报告比例和质量方面仍面临挑战，中方愿与各方一道。积极推动各缔约国按时、按要求提交报告，切实履行条约义务。同时，鼓励各国采用模板提交报告，提高信息透明度，并同各国交流分享经验做法。中方刚刚注意到，欧盟的发言，呃，希中方提加提高呃报告的透明度。事实上，中方已经按照条约的规定提交了初始报告。这充分体现了中方的透明姿态。所有缔约国，包括所有欧盟成员国，都能看到中方的报告。我想，欧盟应该发挥它的影响力，吸引最大的武器出口国加入条约，而非单独对中方的报告透明度提出所谓的关切。谢谢。Thank you to the delegation of China.、Uh, I now hand the floor to Switzerland. Thank you, coaches. Can you hear me all well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then、uh, let me first of all express Switzerland's gratitude for your much appreciated work in light of the still unfavorable circumstances related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Switzerland strongly encourages state parties to not only submit their reports according to the obligation defined in Article 13 of the treaty, but also to make the reports publicly available and to use the online reporting tool for submitting their reports. This not only improves transparency, but also allows for an easy comparison of the data submitted. Switzerland would like to express its support. For the suggested amendments of the frequently asked questions type guidance document on the annual reporting obligations. Thank you. Thank you, Switzerland, for your intervention. Of course, also for your support.、Uh, I now give the floor to Control Arms. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you, co-chairs.、Uh, the ATT Monitor, an independent project of Control Arms, would like to commend both the working group co-chairs and the ATT Secretariat on the efforts taken to prepare the introductory paper, including the proposed amendments to the FAQ type guidance document on the annual reporting obligations. The ATT Monitor would also like to commend the working group co-chairs and the ATT Secretariat for continuing to provide resources and guidance. On reporting during this intersessional period prior to CSP8, and we welcome the opportunity to exchange views on how gender and transparency can be further included in the work of the working group. We fully support the collective work done to improve compliance with reporting obligations, so that all state parties can fully、uh, report accurately and on time. ATT monitor analysis of 2020 annual、uh, ATT annual reports. Shows that the on-time completion rate for 2020 annual reports improved slightly compared to the previous year when the COVID pandemic、um, was、uh, hitting. But the overall ATT annual reporting rate was the lowest of any year and significantly below to the level seen in the first round、uh, um, of ATT reporting, which marked the highest compliance rate of any reporting year at 88%. Despite the persistent challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021, the geographic and systemic diversity of those that were able to report by the deadline indicates that the largest impediment to engagement in ATT reporting is most likely the lack of political will. Because annual reporting is an obligation in Article 13.3, there is still work to be done to support full compliance of these obligations by all state parties. ATT monitor analysis further shows that the rate of public reporting continued to drop with the submission of 2020 annual reports. Only 40% of the states' parties due to submit a report submitted one that was publicly available. 
In fact, the percentage of publicly available 2020 annual reports is the lowest since 2015. Private reporting, on the other hand, continue its upward trend. 31% of the total 2020 annual reports submitted were confidential, compared to 23% of 2019 annual reports. As with annual reports, there also remains an upward trend towards private reporting for initial reports, as 20% of all submitted initial reports are confidential, as the ATT Secretariat just showed. In, 2025, in 2021, five states parties were due to submit their initial reports, but only, did the, but only one did it, and it kept it private. Also of great concern is the low number of states parties who have submitted updates to their initial reports. To date, as the ATT Secretariat just updated, only six states parties have provided such updates. The ATT Monitor supports the European Union's call for transparency in reporting. We look, we look to states such as those that are permanent members of the UN Security Council and states parties to the ATT to demonstrate leadership in implementing the principles of transparency. Thank you, co-chairs. Thank you to Control Arms for that intervention and also your diligent work uh, for uh, monitoring the ATT reporting in the ATT monitor. Uh, I'm just gonna request whether there are any more requests for the floor. Um, I see that France has requested the floor. France, you have the floor. Je vous remercie um, et, et bonjour à tous. Um, bonjour uh, et, et merci, uh, mesdames uh, les, les co-présidentes. Um, mon intervention va couvrir plusieurs points de l'ordre du jour, mais je me permets dans un, un souci d'économie de temps uh, de la prononcer en une fois, si vous me le permettez. Um, je voudrais tout d'abord, mesdames les co-présidentes, vous remercier pour les différentes uh, propositions formulées dans le document qui a été transmis en amont de cette session du groupe de travail. Nous attachons une grande importance au respect de nos obligations au titre de l'article 13 et transmettons chaque année un rapport sur nos exportations et importations d'armes classiques entrant dans le champ d'application de ce traité. Ce rapport complète les autres rapports qui sont transmis par ailleurs par la France sur ces transferts d'armement dans le cadre des exercices de transparence auxquels nous participons tant au niveau international que multilatéral, régional et national. Nous rappelons que ces différents rapports sont accessibles en ligne et peuvent être consultés par toutes les parties intéressées, qu'il s'agisse de représentants de la société civile ou d'États tiers. Nous appelons tous les États partis à se conformer à leurs obligations au titre du traité sur le commerce des armes et nous les encourageons à rendre public leurs rapports. Comme nous avons déjà eu l'occasion de le dire, nous nous félicitons de la mise en place du Forum sur l'échange d'informations dans la lutte contre le détournement, qui constitue un outil à la fois utile et pertinent pour lutter contre le détournement d'armes classiques. Et nous espérons que la prochaine réunion du DIEF pourra se tenir prochainement. Le document de questions-réponses élaboré dans le cadre de ce groupe de travail est un outil tout particulièrement utile pour appuyer les États dans l'élaboration de leurs rapports annuels, et nous souscrivons aux amendements que vous proposez. Nous remercions également le secrétariat pour sa proposition à laquelle nous souscrivons, visant à développer une base de données permettant d'effectuer des recherches sur les informations communiquées par les États dans leurs rapports nationaux. Nous souhaiterions toutefois rappeler que la mise en œuvre de ce projet ne devra pas conduire à imposer aux États partis l'utilisation des modèles de rapport agréés lors des précédentes conférences des États partis. Nous serions par ailleurs intéressés par toute information complémentaire relative à ce projet, notamment aux coûts induits, aux modalités pratiques de mise en œuvre, mais également aux informations qui seront rendues accessibles. Sur ce dernier point, il s'agit plus particulièrement d'identifier comment cette base de données s'inscrirait en complément de celle développée dans le cadre du registre des Nations Unies sur les armes classiques. Enfin, permettez-moi simplement de rappeler le plein soutien de la France à vos efforts, et je vous remercie, Madame et coprésidente.
thank you, Franz, for that intervention. Um, please note that we will be discussing the online database under uh, the next, uh, under the last agenda item for today. Uh, I see that Costa Rica and Germany have asked for the floor. Uh, I give the floor to Costa Rica. Gracias, señora copresidenta. Costa Rica toma la palabra en este punto de la agenda para agradecer a las facilitadoras del Grupo de Trabajo en Transparencia y Presentación de Informes sus esfuerzos y expresar cuatro temas puntuales de interés para mi país. El cumplimiento de las medidas de transparencia es un pilar fundamental del tratado. Es a través de nuestro compromiso en ese cumplimiento en la presentación de los informes nacionales que abonamos a la rendición de cuentas y fortalecemos ese régimen. De acuerdo a la información que nos presentó la Secretaría, el nivel de cumplimiento de las obligaciones no es el, no es el satisfactorio que quisiéramos. En el caso de Costa Rica, las instituciones de mi país han realizado esfuerzos adicionales en medio de esta pandemia para avanzar en la calidad y la precisión de la información que reflejamos en nuestros informes. En ese sentido, y ante los desafíos que hemos enfrentado en la homologación de categorías y clasificaciones entre las dependencias de la Dirección de Armamento del Ministerio de Seguridad y el Servicio Nacional de Aduanas, solicitamos el año pasado, en el marco del proyecto de promoción del Tratado de la Unión Europea, un taller con expertos para la preparación del informe anual, que esperamos concluir y presentar en las próximas semanas. Adicionalmente, como segundo elemento, en cuanto a los documentos del grupo de trabajo, vemos muy necesario y oportuno, de ser posible pronto, la coordinación con la Organización Mundial de Aduanas para facilitar la identificación de las armas convencionales en el sistema armonizado. Otro elemento importante que debe ser analizado en aras de promover una mayor transparencia, es el aumento en el índice de la presentación de informes privados. Esta práctica representa un reto adicional para identificar efectivamente las deficiencias y las necesidades de los diferentes actores, partes del ciclo de las armas pequeñas y ligeras. Mi país se une al llamado para evitar esta práctica. Finalmente, Costa Rica celebra el esfuerzo del actual grupo de trabajo por evidenciar la correlación del tráfico ilícito y el desvío de armas y los índices de violencia armada, especialmente la violencia de género, por lo que aplaudimos el enfoque de género que están explorando como parte de la elaboración de herramientas de reporte más holísticas y transparentes. Cuentan con el respaldo de Costa Rica en estos esfuerzos. Muchas gracias. Thank you uh, to the delegate of Costa Rica for that um, support and also for sharing your national developments. That's very useful. Um, I now give the floor to Germany. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Germany believes that reporting is a very important tool to provide the transparency the ATT aims for. Civil society can give important additional input on ATT reporting. The Stimson Center and CIPRI have proven this in several projects funded by Germany in the past. However, Germany has the impression that new candidates to the ATT might be put off by reporting obligations. Furthermore, the complexities in reporting might even factor into the slowing down of universalization. Therefore, Germany believes the exchange of good practices and assistance with reporting, for example, through the Voluntary Trust Fund, to be essential. At the same time, Germany believes the possibility of authorizing the United Nations Office for Disarmament to use relevant information as a basis for the report to the United Register on Conventional Arms to be part of a solution to reporting problems, which some state parties or signatory states might have. We hope that the peer-to-peer -peer support amongst states parties can be taken up again, despite the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. Germany supports this idea. Thank you, co-chairs. Thank you, Germany, for that intervention. I now hand the floor to Mexico. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. El gobierno de México agradece el trabajo de los copresidentes. Este grupo de trabajo y todos los esfuerzos para la promoción de la transparencia y la presentación de informes resultan fundamentales 
para la consolidación misma del régimen del tratado. Estos esfuerzos para el gobierno de México pueden ser vistos incluso como un asunto transversal a todos nuestros trabajos. La calidad de los informes es también relevante y es un tema que debemos seguir abordando, sobre todo pensando en que nuestros informes son la base en muchas ocasiones de estudios significativos que se generan no solo de las, desde las instituciones gubernamentales, sino de centros académicos y organizaciones de la sociedad civil que alimentan nuestro entender sobre el régimen del tratado. A pesar de la situación que ha representado y las dificultades logísticas que ha traído la pandemia por COVID-19, el gobierno de México se complace en presentar eh, de manera adecuada y puntual sus informes en los años recientes. Aunque compartimos la preocupación, por supuesto, por la disminución en el número de informes que se presentan anualmente, estamos seguros también que los esfuerzos que se hacen desde este grupo podrán contribuir de manera significativa a componer esta tendencia. Reconocemos el trabajo, por ejemplo, para la actualización de la guía de preguntas sobre la obligación anual de informar. Eh, si bien el Gobierno de México no tiene observaciones puntuales a esta guía, pensamos que justamente se alinea a la, a, a la posibilidad de mejorar la presentación de informes. Reconocemos también que el grupo de trabajo aborda con prioridad en esta ocasión la perspectiva de género. Un asunto acordado desde hace al menos dos conferencias de Estados parte que hoy resulta prioritario eh, aludir en nuestros trabajos en el grupo. Alentamos el uso de los formularios para los informes iniciales y anuales justamente bajo esta misma línea, endosados en nuestra conferencia de Estados Parte 7, en la CSP 7. Y alentamos igualmente a todos los Estados Parte, a todos, los, a todos aquellos actores interesados en los trabajos de transparencia y presentación de informes, a avanzar los esfuerzos para no duplicar esfuerzos en la presentación de informes con otros eh, procesos, tratados y obligaciones que se desprenden de foros internacionales. Evitar esta duplicación de, de esfuerzos y encontrar las sinergias adecuadas para la presentación de informes contribuirá igualmente a mejorar esta tendencia. Gracias. Uh, thank you to Mexico for that intervention and your uh, very helpful suggestions. Uh, I see no more delegation in the room taking, uh, asking for the floor. Are there any online? No, there are not. Uh, with that, we would like to close this agenda item by noting the significant concern expressed by participant that took the floor that 42% of states parties have not fulfilled their annual reporting obligation under Article 13.3 of the treaty last year and 23% of states' parties have not met their obligation to submit their initial report under Article 13.1. As a whole, only 52% of states' parties are in full compliance with their reporting obligations. The co-chairs underline that the reporting obligations are an integral part of the treaty and necessary for its effective functioning. So let's try to reverse the trend this year. The co-chair has also noted uh, concerns about the growing number of countries that make their reports available to state parties only. While there is no obligation to make reports available to all stakeholders, it strongly contributes to the treaty's objective of transparency. The deadline for submitting the annual report is the 31st of May. We call on states parties to make the appropriate efforts to fulfill their obligation, uh, reporting obligations. In doing so, please use the revised reporting templates endorsed at CSP 7. We would also like to point out that it is still possible to hand in reports that were due in previous years and encourage all state parties that have not reported in the past years to do so. We strongly encourage the representatives of states parties to check the ATT website to check whether their report was issued by the Secretariat and posed on the website in accordance with their preferences. With that, we close this agenda item and move to the next item on the agenda concerning 
challenges concerning reporting. As noted in the agenda and the introductory paper, it is the co-chair's intention to address three of the six tasks under this agenda item during this session and to address the remaining three tasks during future meetings. In the interest of time and to avoid member states having to make multiple interventions, the co-chairs will introduce all three tasks at the same time and then invite participants to take the floor on all or any of these tasks. On the, under the first recurring task, working group participants have the opportunity to, to share any challenges they are facing in submitting timely and accurate initial and annual reports. We would like to recall that this is traditionally included in the working group mandate to offer states parties a platform to share problems and difficulties and to share solutions and good practices in the fulfillment of re reporting obligations. And as we just saw in the previous agenda item, there are problems and difficulties in reporting. So please share with us both your problems and as well as good practices to address these issues. The second recurring task under this agenda item concerns the outreach strategy on reporting. As you will recall, CSP5 established the mandate for presidents of conference of state parties for bilateral contacts with states parties that are in arrears with their reporting obligations. In the introductory paper, the co-chairs noted noted and commended the outreach that was done by the presidents of CSP6 and CSP7 via individualized letters and bilateral engagement. We will follow up with the Secretariat on these activities and will report back in due course. We would also like to invite participants of the working group to continue looking for ways and mechanisms to improve the reporting under the ATT and call on states parties, civil society, and regional organizations to brief the working group on initiatives focused on enhancing compliance with reporting obligations. The co-chairs would also like to point to the assistant measures that are in place for supporting implementation of the treaty, including its reporting obligations, such as the voluntary trust fund. The VTF can be a clear catalyst in improving reporting practices as was shared by one state party during the preparatory cycle of CSP 8. We encourage beneficiaries of the VTF and other assistance mechanisms to keep reporting on their experiences and progress. Now I would like to hand over the reins to Grizel to cover the last task under this agenda item, which is the frequently asked type uh, guidance documents on the annual reporting obligations. Muchas gracias, Sabine. Eh, como todos saben, esta es una de las tareas recurrentes bajo este tema de la agenda. Tal vez recuerden que el documento de orientación tipo preguntas frecuentes sobre la obligación de presentar informes anuales fue endosado por los Estados Partes en la Conferencia de Estados Partes 3 y actualizado en la quinta Conferencia de Estados Partes con un número de enmiendas que eran necesarias para reflejar la introducción de la herramienta de presentación de informes en línea. El año pasado, la séptima Conferencia de Estados Partes endosó la plantilla actualizada de presentación de informes anuales a ser utilizada por los Estados Partes en el cumplimiento de sus obligaciones de conformidad con el artículo 13.3 del Tratado sobre el Comercio de Armas. A la luz de este desarrollo, las copresidentas revisaron el documento de orientación tipo preguntas frecuentes y con el respaldo de la Secretaría del ATT, Hemos preparado un proyecto de modificaciones sugeridas para el documento para reflejar la plantilla revisada. Pueden encontrar estas propuestas en el anexo A de nuestro documento introductorio. En esta etapa me gustaría ceder la palabra a la señora Sara Parker de la Secretaría del ATT para que brinde una descripción general de los cambios sugeridos. Sara, por favor. Hello again, and thank you so much to the co-chairs for this opportunity. Um, I won't be talking through the, the changes in detail, but just to give an overview of the types, the nature of the changes that have been proposed and suggested in the FAQ document. Um, so as mentioned, this is Annex A to the co-chairs introductory paper, and the suggested changes, the proposed changes, are in markup or in red, so you can clearly see what is being suggested. Uh, just by way of background, the guidance document we're referring to was initially prepared by Belgium in 2017 and was designed to help states prepare their annual reports. 
It consists of a series of questions and answers, and this is why it's referred to as the FAQ document, meaning frequently asked questions. Um, so the FAQ document was endorsed by CSP3 as an informative and open-ended reference document, and the conference noted that, I quote, proposals for alterations and additional questions and answers may be made at any time and should be considered in the working group on transparency and reporting. So this is what we're doing today. We're considering some proposals that are being made uh, to the document. Uh, so as already suggested or mentioned, following the adoption of the revised reporting templates by the seventh conference of states parties, it was felt that a proposal to amend the FAQ document was needed to ensure that it is aligned with the current annual reporting template. Uh, so many of the changes in the guidance document are designed to take account of changes that were made to the template and to reflect the fact that the reporting template has been amended. So for example, the guidance document refers to the fact the annual reporting template now includes a specific field inviting a reporting state to authorize the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs to use information in the report as a basis for the state's report to the UN Register. Many of you will recall that there is now a specific field in the annual reporting template that allows states to indicate this. Uh, also on the cover page of the annual reporting template, the date for submission has been changed to the date of the report because they are often not the same. The date that the state prepares the report is not always the date that it submits the report. So these changes have occurred in the, or are suggested in the FAQ document. Um, furthermore, there is a suggestion to remove the references to voluntary and mandatory questions and other elements to reflect the removal of this terminology from the annual reporting template. Um, other changes that have been suggested include some cosmetic changes and the correction of uh, an, a single error, I think there was in the document. So for example, uh, the suggestion is made to change the reference to from ATT reporting template to annual reporting template, because of course we must not forget there is also an initial reporting template. Uh, this change makes it clear that the document is referring to the annual reporting template. It's possibly not needed given the title of the document, but it will just remind the user that that's the template we're referring to. Uh, we've also suggested changing secretariat to ATT secretariat. Uh, why? Simply for continuity with other documents um, which are, are a part of the process. We, we prefer the reference to ATT secretariat in full. In terms of uh, an error, as I mentioned, the original response to question 20 indicated that there's a column in the annual reporting template dedicated to intermediate location, where a reporting state can indicate where there is an intermediate location. Um, but in fact, although this column does appear in the UN Register template, uh, it wasn't in the annual reporting template. So we've suggested amending this and inviting states instead to include information on the intermediate location in the remarks column, comments column. Um, Finally, we have suggested making some amendments that give a bit of information, bit more information on how the online reporting platform works, as well as how the Secretariat records the submission of reports and how it uses that information to generate reports on the status of reporting. As, as I mentioned, all of these changes are marked up in red for ease of reference. And I think consideration of this document is quite timely, given that your next annual report is due on the 31st of May 2022. So it's a good opportunity to familiarise yourselves with the uh, FAQ guidance document and the reporting template itself. Thank you so much. Quisiera agradecer a la Secretaría del ATT por su presentación detallada. Espero que esto haya proporcionado más claridad sobre la razón de ser de cada una de estas enmiendas propuestas. Ahora, me gustaría recordar a los participantes que el documento de orientación tipo preguntas frecuentes requiere que las propuestas de reformas y las preguntas y respuestas adicionales sean consideradas en este grupo de trabajo. En nuestro documento introductorio, las copresidentas invitamos a los participantes a revisar las enmiendas sugeridas en el anexo A y enviar cualquier comentario o propuesta adicional de reformas y preguntas adicionales, ya sea a las copresidentas y a la Secretaría de la TT, 
o a través de la plataforma de intercambio de información, a más tardar 10 días antes de nuestra reunión. En este punto, quisiera informarles que las copresidentas no recibieron comentarios o propuestas específicas sobre este documento a través de los canales de comunicación indicados. Me gustaría dar la palabra a los participantes que deseen compartir sus puntos de vista sobre el proyecto de enmiendas sugeridas al documento presentado por las copresidentas y los otros temas bajo este punto de la agenda. Tomamos nota que algunas delegaciones ya se refirieron a esta cuestión en el punto de agenda anterior, pero invitamos a aquellos que no lo hayan hecho a que aprovechen esta oportunidad. Con ello le doy la palabra a Matt for Peace. Tiene usted la palabra. سيدة المزايرة لدي استفسار بخصوص تقديم التقارير لقد ذكرتم أن آخر موعد لإرسال الدول تقريرها في 31 مايو هل متاح لمنظمات المجتمع المدني أن تقدم تقارير موازية لتقديم الدول وترسلها للأمانة العامة قبل 31 مايو؟ شكرا Muchas gracias colega de Más por Peace, pero para aclarar, eh, cuando nos referimos al plazo del 31 de mayo es para los estados eh, cumplan, los estados partes cumplan su obligación de presentación del informe anual. No sé si con esto se, se aclara la, la duda. Es, es para el cumplimiento de la obligación en virtud del artículo 13 del Tratado sobre Comercio de Armas. Eh, espero que esto eh, aclare la duda y si no, igual estamos eh, con los canales abiertos a, a seguir aclarando cualquier otra duda adicional. En, el siguiente orador en mi lista es Japón. Tiene la palabra Japón. Gracias. Japón, would like to express its gratitude to the coaches of the Transparency and Reporting Working Group from the Netherlands and Panama, and also the Secretariat for your dedication to the work of working groups and for preparing the proposed draft update of the FAQ type guidance document. Japan attaches great importance to uh, transparency in the arms trade. As outlined in Article 13 of the tre treaty, Reporting is a fundamental obligation and an important tool for ensuring that transparency. Japan has fulfilled its reporting obligation since joining the treaty, and past three years, we have submitted our annual reports by using the online reporting tools. While Japan shares a concern of the low rate of the compliance with the reporting obligations, we also understand the challenges and difficulties that the state party face for submitting their report in a timely and accurate manner. In this connection, Japan welcomes the ongoing EU project to provide capacity building support to the ATT national points of contact, including fulfilling the reporting requirement. We also thank the uh, Secretariat for organizing an online meeting among national points of contact on Monday, 14th February, as a part of EU project. It was a valuable opportunity to share and understand the challenges facing each state in fulfilling their ATT obligations, including reporting. Regarding the updated FAQ type guidance document, Japan would like to make a preliminary comments on the section two on page four. We see the first paragraph A, article 13.3, contains additional text in the let, in the let between the article text of the treaty. To avoid misunderstanding, as this is not a text found in the treaty, we believe that this additional text should be in a separate paragraph or section. Lastly, transparency is a key purpose of the ATT, and it serves to build confidence among states as well as to promote international and regional peace and security. Japan would like to encourage all the state parties to submit both in their initial, initial and annual reports in a timely manner. Thank you, co-chairs. 
Pues muchas gracias, Japón, y también agradecemos los comentarios específicos que ha proporcionado sobre el, las propuestas de enmiendas. Vamos a analizarlo y lo consideraremos para la próxima eh, reunión del grupo de trabajo. Ahora quisiera eh, cederle la palabra a Sudáfrica. Sudáfrica tiene la palabra. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Um, I wish to congratulate you on um, the manner in which you're uh, conducting, you and your co-chair conducting uh, this meeting thus far. Um, I waited until this agenda item, just to re go back quickly to agenda item one. Um, South Africa's uh, annual report um, has been late for the last two years. And that is as, as a result of a, um, an internal discussion that we have. The reports have been completed. It's just the manner in which we wish to package the final document. So it's not a lack of political will by any means. Uh, and they will be submitted uh, for each of, of the two outstanding years. Um, and as I say, I waited until we got to this agenda item because um, you may recall that at CSP7, we had a distinct difficulty with uh, an amendment to the report of that year. Because in the report of this working, uh, working group, uh, it was stated that the aim of amending the reporting template was to um, address certain inconsistencies uh, and um, also gaps um, in, in reporting. Now, the amendment that was proposed did not fall under any of those categories. It, it was a very intrusive, uh, in our reading, very intrusive um, proposed amendment, which is very sensitive. Uh, and that is of disclosure of denials. Um, and, and all states do deny certain uh, transfer, or yeah, do deny certain transfers. Uh, and it's our sovereign right to do so. Um, and we, it's not for public debate. Um, it, 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 is, it can harm bilateral relations quite severely. So we, um, we did make a interpretative statement and that was annexed to the report of CSP7. It's there on the website. Um, now, I think that we should approach with this issue of amending the templates with a certain degree of caution. Um, it is always tempting to see how you can reinvent the wheel. Um, my experience is that it is, it, it's not very helpful. I, I don't mind looking at, as Sarah uh, introduced certain um, window dressing, should we call it, amendments to the template, that's fine. But we should be very cautious how we move on this issue on substantive issues. Um, Many of us in this room also deal with the mine ban treaty. Now, there we tinkered around with the template for uh, years and it was amended and amended and what did we an end up with? We ended up with uh, a guide. There's no template anymore, there's a guide. So do we want to set this thing and, and, and put it to bed uh, or do we want to end up where we did with the mine ban treaty in having a carte blanche, you can submit whatever you want to. So, you know, it's, it's always very um, tempting to get into this particular field of, of looking at dotting I's and crossing T's, but that's not what we're here for. Um, we, we need to be very cautious as a final point that um, 
there's a certain element uh, in our work that relates to universalization. And if it appears to those outside the convention that we keep shifting the goalposts with this, they're going to turn around and say, you know, wh where are you heading with this thing? You know, it, this, this looks all the more complicated. And we, we would just stay outside this treaty. So um, I hope that that kind of clarifies where we stand as South Africa on this matter. I uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Muchísimas gracias a la distinguida delegación de Sudáfrica y, y tomamos nota, obviamente, de en la posición de su país y todo el proceso de la adopción de, las, en, de los formatos para la presentación de informe, pero eh, solamente para también eh, brindarle más información, obviamente este ejercicio que estamos haciendo en este momento es un poco de seguimiento a las decisiones que fueron adoptadas en la última conferencia de Estados Partes. Y, Es la primera vez que se está eh, generando un debate sobre los cambios que se están introduciendo en el documento sobre preguntas frecuentes. Y precisamente estos son los espacios para no solamente manifestar apoyo, hacer eh, propuestas de modificación, pero también cualquier duda o reservas que se tengan, es importante hacerlo para tomarlo en cuenta eh, para las próximas reuniones y cómo vamos a ir reflejando este documento eh, eh, más adelante y que nos mantenemos obviamente a la disposición para continuar este diálogo aquí en, en el marco del grupo de trabajo y también bilateralmente. Con esto paso la palabra a Bélgica. Bélgica tiene la palabra. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and um, may I say good luck um, to you both. Um, as co-chairs, uh, I've been in that seat and I know that it's uh, sometimes a difficult position to be in. I also just wanted to say uh, one word about the proposed amendments to the um, FAQ um, document. Um, firstly, that we support them uh, in general uh, and also as necessary um, to have the document in line with the amendments and maybe to um, also put our South African colleague a bit at ease. We were very much uh, convinced of the necessity to um, amend the reporting templates themselves, but um, for us that is a process um, that is now finished. We, I think we spent um, three years on, on that, um, and it's finished, and we also don't have any intention um, to change those in, in the years to come. Obviously, at one, at one point, an evaluation will be in order, but at least for the forthcoming years, we want to also work with the templates that we now have had, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean um, that the FAQ document needs to be in line with them, and in, in that sense, we think it's necessary to discuss that now. Um, the other small point that I wanted to make about it, um, we will make in writing because there are also very uh, small technical issues of which uh, our Japanese colleague has pointed out one already that we also had identified, but so those will be coming to you uh, and the Secretariat in writing. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, el siguiente orador en mi lista es China. Eh, China tiene la palabra. Gracias, presidente. Gracias, presidente. Gracias, presidente. Gracias, presidente. Gracias, presidente. Gracias, presidente. Gracias,准备首份年度报告 
提到了，呃呃，这个年度报告，呃，是不是应该呃对公众公开？其实呢，呃，减少了就是呃缔约国的选项，呃，是不是向呃是不是仅向呃缔约国公开，还是向呃？公众公开，我想呢，这还是要尊重呃缔约国的呃权利啊，呃，另外呢，呃，中方呃还呃呃中方啊认为啊，就是为了呃吸引呃或者是更加有利于这个缔约国呃提交报告，能不能呃第一呢加强呃这个条约的这个报告模板跟登记册的常规武器登记册报告模板的。协同，另外呢，尽量的呃，能让这个报告模板呃更加的呃友好啊，方便缔约国呃提交报告。呃，谢谢主席。Muchas gracias. Ahora le doy la palabra a Argentina. Eh, muchas gracias, señora eh, copresidenta. Al ser esta la primera vez que mi delegación toma la palabra en el grupo de trabajo sobre transparencia y presentación de informes, quisiéramos felicitarla a usted y a la señora Visser por su nombramiento como copresidenta de este importante grupo y asegurarles el pleno apoyo y, colabor y colaboración de mi delegación en sus labores. Asimismo, quisiéramos agradecer a la señora Parker de la Secretaría de la TT por su presentación del documento guía sobre fre eh, preguntas frecuentes. Mi delegación da la bienvenida a las enmiendas incluidas en este documento, el cual creemos cuál ayudará a mejorar la presentación de informes, máximo teniendo en cuenta el porcentaje decreciente en materia de presentación de los mismos. La Argentina considera que la transparencia y el intercambio de información son temas fundamentales para generar confianza entre los estados y en ese sentido, mi país ha cumplido con sus obligaciones derivadas del artículo 13.1 y 13.3, presentando su informe inicial, así como los informes anuales en los plazos estipulados. Esperamos que el documento de orientación enmendado coadyuve a que la información recogida en los mismos permita identificar los principales desafíos para la implementación del tratado facilitar el intercambio de información y buenas prácticas entre los estados y diseñar lecciones aprendidas. Eh, dicho esto, mi delegación quisiera reiterar a los cochears su agradecimiento por todos los esfuerzos realizados. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. El siguiente orador en mi lista es Control Arms. Tienen ustedes la palabra. Buenos días, eh, copresidentas. El monitor del ATT felicita nuevamente a las copresidentas del grupo de trabajo y a la Secretaría del ATT por los esfuerzos integrales realizados para apoyar a los Estados partes en la implementación total de la obligación de presentación de informes. Existen una serie de centros de investigación y recursos de la sociedad civil que sirven como fuente de información sobre la implementación del ATT y contribuyen con investigaciones y análisis para ayudar a fortalecer los esfuerzos de implementación del tratado y mejorar la transparencia del comercio de armas convencionales. Específicamente, el monitor del ATT apoya a los estados a abordar sus desafíos en la presentación de informes al sintetizar información y analizar tendencias y desarrollos sobre el cumplimiento de los informes del ATT, eh, al evaluar los estándares en la presentación de informes nacionales y los compromisos con la transparencia, al proporcionar análisis país por país sobre las prácticas en la presentación de informes y sus respectivas transferencias, y al identificar patrones y tendencias de exportaciones e importaciones de armas convencionales y comparar eso contra los criterios de la TT. Las partes interesadas de la TT pueden consultar los informes anuales que producimos para obtener eh, información sobre las obligaciones de la presentación de informes, ejemplos de desafíos y buenas prácticas, recomendaciones concretas sobre cómo los estados pueden abordar estos desafíos. Por ejemplo, en el informe anual de 2021, 
el monitor del ATT evaluó los primeros cinco años de presentación de informes anuales para determinar si dichos informes cumplieron con la promesa y los requisitos del ATT. Encontramos que una serie de tendencias en la presentación de informes amenazan con socavar tanto la transparencia en el comercio mundial de armas como los compromisos de los estados partes con el objeto y propósito del tratado. El monitor de la TT desea elogiar los esfuerzos realizados por las presidencias de la Conferencia de Estados Partes 6 y 7 para realizar actividades de divulgación con respecto a aquellos estados partes que sistemáticamente no han podido cumplir con sus obligaciones en la presentación de informes. Además de los documentos o del documento Estrategias de Divulgación sobre la Presentación de Informes, la participación bilateral con los estados no solo sirve como un recordatorio de las obligaciones en la presentación de informes, sino que también brinda una oportunidad para que los estados puedan plantear inquietudes que puedan ayudar a adaptar el tipo de asistencia que se les puede proveer. También acogemos con beneplácito el seguimiento de la Secretaría de la TT de las cartas individualizadas enviadas por el presidente de la Conferencia de Estados Partes 7, y felicitamos a todos los estados partes que presentaron informes iniciales y anuales en respuestas a estas cartas. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, hemos agotado la lista de oradores y no vemos otras solicitudes aquí en sala o en la plataforma virtual para hacer uso de la palabra. En nombre de las copresidentas, deseo agradecerles a todos por el fructífero debate y los valiosos aportes, incluyendo las actualizaciones sobre los esfuerzos de divulgación, así como el amplio apoyo a las enmiendas sugeridas, incluso las propuestas específicas y eh, observaciones de reservas. Eh, con, con respecto a las preguntas, bueno, por el momento no hemos recibido ni una pregunta particular ni solicitud de aclaración, pero de haberlo y, y si ustedes tienen a bien también presentar comentarios adicionales o propuestas concretas sobre estos documentos, los invitamos a compartirlas con nosotras eh, por escrito o a través de la plataforma de intercambio de información. Con esto concluimos nuestra consideración de este tema de la agenda y pasaremos al tema 3 de la agenda sobre informes de carácter sustantivo y cuestiones de transparencia. Como se señaló en la agenda y el documento introductorio, la intención de las copresidentas es abordar dos de las cuatro tareas bajo este tema de la agenda durante esta sesión y abordar las restantes durante las futuras reuniones. Conscientes de las limitaciones de tiempo, las copresidentas presentaremos las dos tareas una tras otra y luego invitaremos a los participantes a tomar la palabra sobre cualquiera o todas de estas tareas. Como ustedes recordarán, la quinta conferencia de Estados Partes examinó diferentes aspectos de género y cuestiones relacionadas con la violencia de género en el contexto de la TT y decidió que para aumentar la comprensión del impacto de género de la violencia armada en el contexto del ATT, se alentará a todos los presidentes de los grupos de trabajo y facilitadores a considerar los aspectos de género en sus sesiones. Esta decisión se encuentra reflejada en el párrafo 22.b.1. Además, los estados partes acordaron revisar los avances en materia de género y violencia de género de forma continua. Si bien las copresidentas subrayan que este tema no está incluido en el mandato y que en el tratado no existe una obligación de proporcionar información sobre las discusiones temáticas, su inclusión responde al interés expresado por muchos participantes durante los ciclos anteriores sobre la importancia de continuar las discusiones sobre este tema de actualidad y buscar formas de operacionalizar las decisiones adoptadas eh, por la Conferencia de Estados Partes en 2019. Hemos notado que algunos estados ya han dado pasos en esta dirección al integrar consideraciones de género en sus informes iniciales, incluyendo la referencia a acuerdos internacionales, criterios para el procedimiento nacional de evaluación de riesgos, 
y la provisión de asistencia y capacidades. Sin más preámbulos, me gustaría invitar a la señora Alison Fritac de la Liga Internacional de Mujeres por la Paz y la Libertad a reflexionar acerca de las formas de promover la transparencia con respecto al tema de género y violencia de género dentro del marco de la TT. Alison, tiene la palabra. Thank you very much. I'm just going to, if you could bear with me for one moment while I share my PowerPoint here. Um, ah. All right. I think we may have to pass on that actually, and I'll, I will just dive in. Um, first, Just to say, uh, it's very nice to be with you all today virtually. I wish that I could be there in person and to offer our thanks to the co-chairs of this working group for inviting Wilk to share a few thoughts and words on the subject of gender and reporting. Uh, we appreciate both the space to share some of our ideas with you, Um, but also that you've made space for this subject on the working group's agenda. And today I'm going to focus on why to consider gender in the context of ATT reporting, um, but also some ideas for how that could be done. And then I'm just going to wind up my presentation by talking a little bit about uh, the experience of reporting on gender in the context of the program of action on small arms and light weapons. So uh, to, to get us started, why, why should we think about gender and reporting? Well, first and foremost, uh, let us recall that Article 7.4 is a legally binding provision within the treaty. It is not an optional part of the risk assessment process. In fact, the desire to prevent GBV through the ATT risk assessment process is quite clear in the treaty's text. And it's important to remember uh, within the arms control community that this obligation corresponds with other frameworks like the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, various human rights conventions that most, if not all, ATT states parties have endorsed. However, what we have learned over time is that how states parties assess for the risk of gender-based violence varies quite a lot. Um, some uh, include it within their general human rights risk assessments. Others have made it more prominent within their corresponding national policies and legislation. Some states have expressed concern about time constraints, information constraints that prevent them from maybe digging a little bit deeper or knowing which resources to consult. And so the term gender-based violence may also not yet be as widely fully or understood by those making the risk assessments, despite how much those of us attending these meetings have talked about it. And I, I offer these observations based on my experience over the last several years in joining different training and capacity building activities that control arms, the Stimson Center, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy have organized from the research of Wilk's own national sections um, in listening to your statements and reading your submissions, in particular to the Wigeti, and also in reading various publications and resources on this topic. So from where Wilk sits, what is very much bound up in the why to report on gender and GBV is this very direct treaty obligation in 7.4, but also because reporting on its implementation will lead to the kind of information sharing that can thus improve everyone's implementation of this part of the treaty. And then a second part of the why is that there is a chronic and well-established problem of under-reporting of gender-based violence in all countries and societies worldwide, There is also a lack of sex and gender disaggregated information. Doing more to report on gender-based violence and Article 7.4 implementation, it's not going to solve this problem entirely, but it is a step in the right direction. It will help to make gender-based violence less of an invisible problem and more visible. It will keep it at the fore of our work, improve transparency and information sharing, and, contr and contribute to the wider body of available information. 
So changing now to the how can we do this? Um, I'm really going to throw a, a range of ideas out there. Uh, they're going to encompass both reporting on implementation of 7.4, but also some ideas for informal sharing and activities that relate to these topics, some of which touch on other of the CSP5 outcomes. And they're very much ideas and possibilities. Um, all would benefit from more discussion and development. This is very much today just a starting point. And the most obvious starting point, of course, is to look at the ATT voluntary reporting templates as updated in 2021. And in particular, the initial report template does include a question found in section 3E, um, asking if national risk assessment procedures include all of the criteria described in Article 7.1 A and B and Article 7.4. And while the question has the same yes or no format as the rest of the template, there is the encouragement to provide further information or elaborate more if no was the answer. So what might be some possible um, additional points that states parties could include here? Uh, states parties could describe what steps or individuals or departments does your national gender-based violence risk assessment process include? What uh, types of sources are you looking into? What gaps and challenges are you experiencing? Um, are you engaging at all with gender advisors within your governments? Um, and how do gender-based violence considerations generally impact on arms transfer decision-making? Um, and as we, we've heard and talked about today and has, has been a topic in, in many ATT meeting cycles, uh, there has been a long-standing encouragement to update initial reports as well as for outstanding ones to, to come in. So I will here um, you know, kind of combine a pitch to update and submit those initial reports, but also really make use of the space now offered in this template to answer this question on gender and GBV more fully. And then turning to the annual report templates, um, some of you may recall that back in the CSP5 meeting cycle, an earlier version of the president's paper had suggested including a question on GBV in the annual report template. Uh, that, that did not happen then, and some have noted that the more quantitative format of this template could make gender reporting more challenging. Back in 2019, Wilkes and a few others uh, suggested the possibility that the question could sort of be framed around asking if transfers are being denied because of GBV concerns. And I think this speaks to one of the biggest questions about the treaty's overall impact is if some of the harms that it was designed to prevent are in fact being prevented. And even if the, the details of that denial cannot be disclosed, Starting to see if GBV has been grounds for a denial is important and useful for our collective work in this area. Um, now, the, the templates are, of course, voluntary. It's useful and important that states use them uh, in order to have consistency of information and for analytical purposes. But I think we could also consider that if, if the current form may not serve the scope or scale of information that could be shared on gender or GBV, you know, we might want to, as, as the ATT community, start thinking about um, the possibility of attachments or an annex document that could capture relevant information, or how we can make use of other uh, informal mechanisms like the ATT BAP, civil society reporting, as we've heard about today. Um, and I think that there's also here a lot of scope to think about other informal channels of dialogue and exchange rather than uh, thinking of reporting solely as the submission of reports. And this is really a great way to try to pick up on other of the CSP5 outcomes that are maybe less centrally focused on Article 7.4. And I apologize that my, my PowerPoint crashed just as I was about to launch my presentation, but here I was intending to put up some of the text from the final report of CSP5 so that we could be reminded of what is in it together um, because there's quite a lot of different points um, you know, around sharing CSP policies and practices toward achieving gender greater balance during formal sessions or side events. Um, 
there is the encouragement to support research that helps to increase the gendered impact of armed violence in the context of the ATT and a very concrete call for lists of existing research and data sources being compiled and made available. Um, there's also an encouragement to states parties to provide information on their national practices in GBV risk assessment, which I think can be read as a clear incentive to report on and respond to that question in the initial report template, as well as making use of other forums like the Wigeti. Um, and then there's also, you know, references to building gender considerations into VTF projects, possibly VTF recipients could think about uh, doing a roundtable or having an exchange on how that's going for them or challenges that they've been experiencing, et cetera. Um, so just to kind of round things off, I wanted to share briefly a little bit about the experience of reporting on gender in the context of the program of action on small arms and light weapons. It is of course a distinct instrument from the arms trade treaty, but obviously they're closely interconnected. This is both true substantively, but also in terms of who may be the people collecting information and submitting national reports. Um, so POA reporting occurs every two years and updates to its voluntary templates are not done in the same uh, negotiated process as, as we have here in the ATT. Uh, gender considerations began to be included in the POA report template following outcomes of the six biennial meetings of states and the third review conference, which was in 2018. Currently, section 10 of the template asks two questions. 10.1 asks if the country takes into account gender considerations, which is admittedly a bit of a vague term. However, there are eight follow-on sub-questions which parse out what gender considerations could refer to. And each of those sub-questions is very clearly linked to outcomes that were found in the BMS 6 and Red Concrete outcome documents. So they're very much anchored in the consensus agreements of member states. Question 10.2 asks if the country collects gender disaggregated data on gender and small arms and light weapons. And a third question is just kind of open for additional comments. So ahead of BMS 7 in 2021, WILP and IANSA collaborated on an analysis of gender reporting in the 2020 POA reports. Um, I, can, I can put the link in the chat later on and it's, def it's also gonna be in the, in the PowerPoint that will go onto the website. Um, I wanted to just quickly share a few of the findings, particularly those which might be instructive or useful for us in the ATT community to bear in mind if we want to advance gender and reporting. Um, so first, did many member states uh, respond or use this part of the template? Well, of the member states who submit POA reports, which is about 46% of the total UN membership, um, of those, around 61.8% answered that they do take gender considerations into account, 10.6% said they do not, and 28% did not respond to the section at all. Of the reports that we examined, 21% uh, answered yes to collecting disaggregated data, 36% answered no, but 42% did not answer at all. So we have some substantive findings in that there was a lack of additional information and details uh, being provided in this section of report, but also that a lot of member states were not responding to the section at all. And I think given all that we've heard in this session today and earlier um, meetings of this working group about reporting challenges, reporting fatigue and, and decreased reporting rates, um, I think we should maybe think about how we can offer as much guidance and support to states parties who want to pursue reporting on gender, GBV and the ATT um, so that we, we don't just do it as a, as a nice gesture, but it can actually be something that has impact and is, is implementable. Um, so I will stop there. I'm looking forward to hearing what others uh, have to say. And again, this is really just a, a starting point of hopefully what will be a longer conversation. Thank you. 
Gracias, Alison, por tu presentación y tus valiosos aportes. Esperamos que estas reflexiones puedan servir como guía para los estados partes sobre los diferentes enfoques que podrían tomar para integrar las consideraciones de género mientras cumplen sus obligaciones de presentación de informes en el futuro y para extraer lecciones aprendidas de otros esfuerzos de presentación de informes. Eh, como mencionamos, vamos a ir por todos los subpuntos de agenda y luego abriremos eh, el piso para los, las delegaciones que quieran hacer uso de la palabra. Entonces, con esto pasamos a nuestro siguiente subpunto. Como ustedes saben, este tema de la agenda brinda eh, a los participantes la oportunidad de plantear y discutir cuestiones sustantivas sobre las obligaciones de presentación de informes que podrían beneficiarse de la consideración del grupo de trabajo. Esta es una tarea recurrente. En nuestro documento introductorio, las copresidentas invitamos a todos los participantes a plantear por escrito a través del correo electrónico eh, a las copresidentas o a la Secretaría de la TT o a través de la plataforma de intercambio de información cualquier cuestión sustantiva que, deseen, que se discuta en el grupo de trabajo sobre transparencia y presentación de informes durante el ciclo actual de la Conferencia de Estados Partes eh, número 8. Hasta la fecha, eh, las copresidentas no han recibido ningún aporte por escrito. Alentamos a los participantes que estén en condiciones de hacerlo a que planteen esta cuestión ahora o a través de los canales de comunicación indicados anteriormente. Ahora pasamos a una tarea específica que es intercambiar prácticas, desafíos y limitaciones con respecto a la disponibilidad pública de los informes anuales e iniciales. Una discusión sobre este tema tuvo lugar durante el, el ciclo anterior para la, conferencia, para la séptima conferencia de Estados Partes. Las copresidentas eh, consideran valioso continuar el debate sobre este tema para comprender los desafíos, las limitaciones y o las preferencias de los Estados Partes que eligen no hacer públicos sus informes sin cuestionar su derecho a hacerlo. Alentamos a los Estados Partes, cuyos informes se han hecho accesibles únicamente en el área restringida del sitio web, a que señalen cualquier cambio de preferencia a la Secretaría de la TT. Como mi copresidenta Sabine mencionó anteriormente, eh, las copresidentas estamos preocupadas por el creciente número de países que ponen sus informes únicamente a disposición de los Estados partes. Y aunque no existe una obligación en el tratado de poner los informes a disposición del público, esto contribuye en gran medida al objetivo del tratado de transparencia y aumenta las oportunidades de asistencia técnica y cooperación. Me gustaría dar la palabra a los participantes para preguntas, comentarios sobre la presentación realizada del tema de género y cualquiera de las tareas recurrentes sobre este punto de agenda. Eh, alentam, además, alentamos a aquellos que están realizando esfuerzos para incorporar las consideraciones de género en sus informes a que presenten sus experiencias y buenas prácticas. Y con esto cedo la palabra a Nigeria. Nigeria tiene la palabra. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving Nigeria the floor. Uh, being my delegation's first time of taking the floor, permit me to congratulate you on your position as co-chairs of this working group. Um, co-chairs, my delegation wishes to make a few comments in national capacity on transparency reporting. Uh, kindly pardon our late inputs as we were experiencing some technical difficulties earlier. Um, Co-chairs, at the outset, my delegation wishes to register its approval for the amendments made to the recently circulated FAQ document. We prioritize transparency reporting as a key element for information gathering, a means of ev evaluating states' fulfillment of their reporting obligations to the ATT. As such, Nigeria recently submitted its annual import-export report for 2021, having previously sought a submission extension deadline in 2021. Uh, my delegation 
would like to reiterate its support for the HET and will continue to ensure compliance to HET reporting obligations and policies. Finally, Nigeria looks forward to engaging with the new FAQ document to guide its future reporting obligations. I thank you, co-chairs. Muchas gracias a Nigeria por sus comentarios y ahora le cedo la palabra a la representación del Estado de Palestina. At the outset, the State of Palestine would like to extend its gratitude to the co-chairs of the Working Group on Transparency and Reporting from the Netherlands and Panama, and to the Secretariat for all your efforts in ensuring the success of this constructive dialogue. In reference to this item, the substantive reporting and transparency issues, the State of Palestine reiterates that annual reports are one of the main methods of transparency and building confidence at our disposal. Reporting on implementation should reflect accurate and comprehensive data, as well as compliance, inconsistencies, and gaps. So reporting the total number of each weapon type without stating final exporting or importing countries will not be sufficient to determine compliance. Thank you. Muchas gracias al Estado de Palestina. En, por el momento no vemos ni una otra solicitud. Ah, bueno, eh, vemos que la delegación de Argentina ha solicitado la palabra. Tiene la palabra Argentina. Sí, muchas gracias, señora copresidenta. Eh, mi delegación quisiera agradecer a la Liga Internacional de Mujeres por la Paz y la Libertad por su detallada presentación. Es sabido que para la Argentina la temática de género reviste un valor fundamental y así lo ha expuesto en diversos foros internacionales, además de su práctica a nivel nacional. Consideramos que se debe continuar trabajando en la creación de indicadores y recopilación de información a nivel nacional sobre género y violencia de género, así como en su oportuna publicación antes del 31 de mayo de cada año, fecha límite para la presentación de los informes anuales de conformidad con el artículo 13 del tratado. Contar con esta información puede ser una base sólida para dar una discusión sobre la posible inclusión de una categoría específica y voluntaria sobre género y violencia basada en género en los informes. Por lo pronto, la Argentina se encuentra lista para compartir con otras delegaciones y partes interesadas información adicional sobre los resultados de los estudios nacionales sobre uso de armas de fuego y femicidios. Finalmente, mi delegación quisiera reiterar su agradecimiento a la señora Alison Pitlack por su eh, excelente presentación y su apoyo a los incansables esfuerzos de la WILF en la promoción de la agenda de género, no solo en el ámbito de la TT, sino también en otros foros sobre control de armamentos, así como de desarme y no proliferación. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Argentina, por sus comentarios y valoramos mucho la, el ofrecimiento de proporcionar eh, información sobre los estudios realizados sobre esta cuestión que es tan de actualidad. Eh, el siguiente orador en mi lista es Control Arms. Tiene la palabra. Uh, Madam co -chairs. Control Arms appreciates the new focus of the Working Group on Transparency and Reporting on Gender. Engaging with the commitments made by ATT state parties as CSP5 to incorporate gender into, the, into its work is critical. And we are pleased to see this working group address head on and incorporate these commitments into their work, the CSP8 cycle. We would also like to thank Alison Pitlock of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom for her insightful and important presentation today. Control Arms supports the concept of including gender aspects into the reporting templates. In places where gender disaggregated information is available, Control Arms encourages state parties to include such information, even if not formally requested within the templates. 
to initiate and maintain active engagement with the specific commitments state parties made on gender at CSP5 more broadly, control arms with support from Canada and in close cooperation with Wolf and other partners is currently developing a methodology to monitor the progress of the ATT CSP and its state parties, both individually and collectively in meeting the CSP5 gender commitments. In the coming months, we will be engaging with a variety of CTT stakeholders to collect input on the proposed methodology before we finalize and introduce the project and its results at CSP 8 this August. We look forward to engaging with all we would like, who would like to input into this project, and we thank you in advance for sharing your time and expertise. Thank you, Madam Coaches. Muchas gracias. Eh, creo que ahora sí hemos agotado nuestra lista de oradores. No veo aquí en sala eh, ninguna solicitud de palabra, ni tampoco en la sala virtual. En ese caso, eh, deseo agradecer a la Liga Internacional de Mujeres por la Paz y la Libertad y a todos los participantes que tomaron la palabra para este diálogo provechoso. Las copresidentas deliberarán sobre cómo llevar más allá de este tema e informar al respecto en su debido tiempo. Invitamos a todos los estados partes a reflexionar sobre las cuestiones planteadas y a explorar formas y opciones para incluir consideraciones de género en sus informes eh, del ATT. Con esto concluimos la consideración del tema 3 de la agenda. Pasamos ahora al tema 4 de la agenda relacionado con los medios institucionales para el intercambio de información. Comencemos con nuestra primera tarea recurrente que ofrece a los participantes la oportunidad de proponer y debatir sobre mecanismos, procesos o formatos estructurados que faciliten los intercambios de información que son requeridos o alentados por el tratado, tanto en el plano normativo como en el plano operativo. Dado que el número de usuarios que han solicitado acceso a la plataforma de intercambio de información sigue siendo bastante limitado, las copresidentas alientan encarecidamente a los estados partes y estados signatarios que se registren en línea para acceder al área restringida del sitio web de la TT y para acceder a la plataforma informática. Además, las copresidentas recuerdan que los intercambios a través del portal de intercambio de información son uno de los niveles predefinidos en el enfoque de tres niveles para compartir información sobre desvíos que fue endosado por los estados partes en la cuarta conferencia de estados partes, junto con las discusiones en el grupo de trabajo sobre implementación efectiva del tratado y el foro de intercambio de información sobre desvíos, aprobado por la sexta conferencia de estados partes. En el documento introductorio, las copresidentas acogen favorablemente cualquier propuesta por escrito, por correo electrónico a las copresidentas y a la Secretaría del ATT o a través de la Plataforma de Intercambio de Información, así como propuestas orales durante la reunión de hoy. Tenemos que informarles que a la fecha no hemos recibido propuestas por escrito. Con respecto a nuestra segunda tarea recurrente, sobre el enfoque de tres niveles para compartir información sobre desvíos, me gustaría invitar al señor Tom Nis, presidente del Foro de Intercambio de Información sobre Desvíos, para que brinde una actualización sobre la organización de la primera reunión del foro. Tom, tiene la palabra. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and thank you for given me uh, at least one minute um, of your precious time to update you on that first meeting. Um, unfortunately, at this moment in time, uh, I cannot say for sure when uh, we will have the first um, inaugural meeting of the Diversion Information Exchange Forum. Uh, I was thinking just now, I feel a bit like a chair with no table to sit up because I was I became the chair of the forum already last year and it wasn't possible 
to hold the meeting and we um, I also wrote that in the short report which was also mentioned in the final report of CSP7 the fact that we considered that um, the DEEF meetings need to be held in person and allow broad participation of states, parties and signatories. So we are very much dependent on uh, how the pandemic evolves and on how uh, our meetings will allow exactly that um, broad participation of experts. So in that regard, um, I think that um, um, it's realistic to have some hope maybe for the summer that um, uh, such meeting might uh, be possible and that during CSP8 itself um, we will be um, organizing that first DEEF meeting. I mean, we've heard today uh, support from some states parties uh, for that meeting yesterday. There was many mention made of um, the usefulness uh, of it and also already an indication of some uh, states parties that they, that they are considering to share information within the forum. So I, I truly hope that that will be possible during um, CSP8 and I can only um, encourage state parties um, again now and I will do so also in the coming months uh, to prepare themselves to do so hopefully um, at, um, uh, at CSP8. So um, I don't know whether by the April meeting I will be able to say something more about that but that is the status. Um, um, of it now. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Tom, por esta actualización. Y es muy cierto que todo depende de cómo evolucione la situación sanitaria, pero esperemos que finalmente este año podamos eh, celebrar la primera reunión del foro de intercambio de información sobre desvío y que la misma se pueda realizar, obviamente, en formato presencial, que sería lo más cómodo también para todas las delegaciones que estarán participando en ese intercambio. Eh, dicho esto, doy la palabra a los participantes que deseen intervenir y voy a referirme a la lista de oradores. Si hay alguna no, no, no veo solicitud en sala, no sé si no. no hay solicitud de la palabra para este punto de la agenda. En ese caso, bueno, bueno, Bélgica. <ríe> Le cedemos la palabra a Bélgica. So Sorry, and thank you. Yeah, I didn't really want to combine the two um, um, in one intervention. Um, I just wanted to say one word about the information exchange portal, which has not really um, kicked off yet in, in the use. Um, and, and in that regard, I remember that um, last year we discussed um, a little bit already, um, also with, with the facilitators in, in the implementation working group, um, but the fact that, that an, an information exchange portal could be useful um, for facilitators and co-chairs to prepare working group meetings and potentially also to have some uh, intersessional exchanges with, um, with state. But it seems like uh, <laughs> That is an idea that is hard to turn into practice. So I think maybe we should uh, reflect a little bit uh, on why that is and to what extent um, any changes could be made to the portal in order to facilitate that kind of exchange. Is that, that is maybe a reflection that we can have towards the, the April meeting of uh, the working group. It's just a suggestion, thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, no vemos ninguna otra solicitud. En ese caso, eh, bueno, agra agradecer pues a todos su atención eh, durante la presentación de este punto de agenda y con ello concluimos nuestra consideración de este punto de agenda. Y ahora me gustaría pasarle las riendas a mi copresidenta Sabine para que dirija nuestros debates sobre los dos últimos puntos de la agenda. Thank you, Brazil. Uh, the last uh, agenda item concerns reporting and transparency functionalities of the IT platform. As with the previous agenda items, in the interest of time, we will introduce both tasks under this agenda item uh, first and invite participants to take the floor afterwards. 
And then the first item under agenda point five, which is again a recurring task, states parties have the opportunity to address any problems that they experience using the information exchange platform or using the online reporting tool. Both are located in the restricted area of the ATT website. Regarding the online platform of information exchange, the co-chairs note, as was just mentioned also by the delegation of Belgium, that its use remains highly modest. In the first two years, other than the co-chairs of the working group, only one state party has used the platform to post information in the ATT context. We encourage other state parties to follow the example. The last task on our agenda today is the searchable online database. Today we will follow up on the ongoing discussion regarding the searchable online database which would allow for the extraction and analysis of data in the ATT annual reports. The concept of a searchable online database enjoyed clear consensus in the 2018 working group. The co-chairs are interested in taking this idea forward, though we recognize that the establishment of the database requires a long-term approach with careful consideration to stakeholders' expectations and, of course, to the cost and benefits of, of, of investing in such an instrument. To this end, the co-chairs recall that during the preparatory meeting of the CSP7, the ATT Secretariat presented a background paper with questions aimed at ascertaining, ascertaining what stakeholders want and expect from an online searchable database. This paper is included in Annex C of the introductory paper to the April meeting of last year. It is important to obtain the parameters and desired features of the online tool in order to obtain cost estimates and take the discussion forward. It is also important to establish a shared vision of a database so that no one is surprised or disappointed with the outcome. So far, there has been limited response to the paper. In order to enhance the engagement and thinking of the, on this topic, the co-chairs have invited the European External Action Service to present the EU CoArm online database created in 2020 in order to inform the discussion with a real-life example of a searchable online database. The idea is not to make a carbon copy in the ATT context. That would not be possible. The idea is to provide some ideas and inspiration regarding the possibilities and limitations of a searchable online database in the ATT context, and thereby furthering the discussion. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Aaron Nagan from the European Action, External Action Service to give a presentation. I will ask you for some patience because uh, Mr. Nagan has to set up his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Co-Chairs, for the invitation and for the opportunity to make some free publicity for the CoArm online database. Uh, of course, very happy to um, speak to uh, the states, parties, to the ATT and the uh, assembled uh, civil society organizations here in the room in Geneva as well as online. Um, before going to the database itself, let me see, yes, oh, that was one too many. Um, as a matter of introduction, uh, let me say a couple of words on CoArm, what it is for, for the general awareness of the audience uh, of, on our mandate, uh, reiterate some points on the importance that we see uh, from the EU side to transparency, and then uh, explain how it used to be done, transparency from the EU side, until the launch of the database in 2020, and then I'll show you in a couple of slides uh, the, some examples of what, what the database looks like and what you can actually find there. So very briefly on CoArm, the uh, CoArm is the uh, council working group of the European Union uh, dealing with conventional arms export control. It consists of the 27 member states and is chaired uh, by me. Um, it meets uh, once a month in Brussels, and um, its aim is the implementation uh, of the common position on arms export control of the EU, which is legally binding upon EU member states. And the common position uh, contains 
uh, several obligations for member states, including making assessments on license applications uh, following eight criteria that are uh, part of this common position. They are, these criteria are similar to uh, Article 6 and 7 of the ATT. They go a bit beyond that, I would say. Uh, and part of the obligations under the, um, under the common position on arms export of the European Union is also the uh, delivery of an annual EU arms export, control, uh, arms export report that includes the licenses issued by all EU member states. Um, so, the one other part I'd like to mention of the, the mandate of quorum and the common position is the fact that we have amongst the 27 member states uh, no undercut principle. That means that there is also an obligation to share information amongst member states on denials. Of course, this is quite sensitive and, and confidential information for, um, and it is done in a closed online database that already existed before the public online system um, went into place. Um, a couple of words on the general importance of transparency in arms trade. As, I, as we also mentioned in our statement earlier today, for the EU it is actually, uh, I would say, threefold. It is a matter to ensure accountability for decisions taken by national authorities on issuing arms export licenses. It is a matter also of preventing corruption, I would add to that. Uh, the more transparent the trade in arms is, the less risk of corruption. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, the, the issue of scrutiny, of course, comes into play as well, and, and it's helped by, by, um, by this transparency uh, as well. Uh, and finally, the, the topic of confidence building, indeed, be, between states. Uh, the more transparent we are in our trade in arms, uh, the less risky the arms trade uh, turns out to be. So we see it definitely also as a confidence building measure. Um, so the situation as it was until the launch of the uh, Quorum online database was as follows. This is just one page of the usual EU annual arms export report that we published uh, for the last 22 years already in a written form. And I can uh, tell you these 500 plus pages uh, Altogether, they formed a kind of a brick, a paper brick with which uh, you would be able to kill somebody. It's basically an arm in itself. Um, so, uh, and not only that, it's, it's really unreadable. So in 2019, when the review of the common position on arms export took place, the, the member states agreed to uh, turning that annual written report into a publicly accessible, uh, easily usable database where all this, these numbers would, would be turned into something more intelligible. And that, that is what we did. Uh, we came up with this public online system that allows you to filter, to customize, to analyze, and to visualize uh, all the data that is, that is contained in there. So I'm going to quickly uh, le um, lead you through some of the screenshots from the database, and then I'll, of course, let you know where you can find it so uh, you can have a look for yourself. Uh, all the numbers that you see here are uh, on 2020, the year 2020, which is the last, uh, the most recent available year. Of course, we are now working currently on uh, collecting all the data from the member states uh, about uh, on the year 2021, but that uh, report will probably appear uh, by uh, the end of the summer. Um, so what is included in the database? So we have a brief, uh, you can see the logos on the top of your screen. We have a brief introduction, getting started, explanatory notes, uh, and then we have the database itself, which contains a yearly overview of licenses, uh, an even more detailed overview of the licenses issued, uh, the licenses per geographical area, and then in charts uh, in, with a timeline and a page on denials. Uh, these, this data obviously comes from the member states, the EU member states themselves. They are the ones that are um, 
it is within their competence to issue the licenses. It's a national competence, the, the arms export control. So the only thing that we at the EES do is compile that and turn it into something digestible for all. Uh, Obviously, the updates take place once a year because that's when we publish the new yearly report. Um, so let's see, licenses yearly overview. We can make a breakdown by origin. So the country that issued the license, that obviously is, needs to be one of the 27 EU member states. Uh, then the destination country, which can be either a country, another country of the EU, but it can be any country across the globe, and then you can also make selections per region and per military list category. So here I should explain briefly that the common military list that is used in the, um, in the European Union when issuing arms export licenses has 22 categories, so it is broader and comprises more than the, than the subdivision in seven uh, categories that is used under the ATT and the UN ROCA. Um, so this database obviously contains more information than, than you would find in a national reports uh, to the, or the EU member states to the ATT. Uh, here, a quick show of, uh, for instance, licenses from Austria and Belgium, just selected uh, randomly, uh, no preferences here, uh, where you can see the number of export licenses for 2020, 2019, 2018, a number of licenses, the value of those licenses, and the value of actual exports, if available. Uh, then here we have a selection uh, per region of destination. So here you can see all European export licenses, arms export licenses to Central America and the Caribbean, uh, and to Central Asia, and you have all the data um, added up automatically. Uh, here, per destination country, here we see licenses for Afghanistan and what is it, Albania? Hard to read on such a small screen. Um, uh, also, for these, you know, randomly selected countries, uh, the number of export licenses, the value and um, uh, the value of licenses, as well as the value of actual exports. Um, and of course, this here, in this case, if you uh, combines the export from all EU member states. But you could also search on, for instance, only the Austrian licenses to Afghanistan and you will find exactly what that one EU member state has exported to Afghanistan. Um, you can have a select per uh, military category uh, where also the military category or the, the military list category is explained, uh, what it exactly contains, whether it's ammunition or, or uh, aviation and, uh, or, or uh, armored vehicles or whatever, that is all um, explained in, in the database itself. Um, here, well, this is another way of presenting similar information. I'll just go quickly through it. Uh, this is, here you see the numbers on 2020 overall for um, all EU member states. 30,000 licenses have been ex ex uh, issued last year for a total value of 166 billion. Uh, but the actual arms export value is much lower. This is because some, some member states inflate the value of their licenses quite a bit. So there's a, quite a discrepancy between those numbers. Uh, then you have this beautiful feature where you have the whole uh, global, the map of the world. This one, for some reason, it, it just selected Africa, just to show you an example, but you can, you have on the website, you have the entire world, so you can select, even with your mouse, you can select one country and look at, uh, or a region or a country, and look at what uh, went there from which EU member states. Uh, we have charts uh, showing a uh, number of export licenses issued, um, and the value of export licenses, so you see, uh, oh, the first row is a number of issues, uh, licenses issued to uh, destination, so you see that the US is the main, uh, let's say, beneficiary of EU arms exports. And here you see a timeline uh, over the years from 2013, which is the first year that we have the arms export data available online till 2020. Uh, denials, I mentioned them. Um, 
a breakdown per number of denials and per criteria that has been used to deny a license. Uh, what you cannot search on is who issued the denial because that is confidential information. So you, so you will not find information on which EU member state uh, issued a certain denial. Um, here you see the denial part of the, of the database. Um, and here per criteria. So this is, uh, yeah, of course, the impossible link to this website, uh, which <laughs> I, I can understand you will not be able to uh, uh, copy paste uh, easily or to remember even, uh, but you can find the database by going to the EES website and then search on arms export control policy and then you will come to this part of the website where um, you see the EU, relevant EU information on arms export control and there you will find this particular part of the website which has which includes a link to the searchable online database. We're obviously still working on, on making it uh, slightly easier to access and to find the database. Um, the, before I close, just very briefly, one, one maybe explanation to add from my side, uh, because I know that in the ATT context, you're obviously also looking at, um, you know, what at the costs of it and, and, and uh, how much effort it takes to make it. So I can s tell you that this took five months to build and uh, the costs were around, uh, let's say, 60,000 euros, uh, but I must add to that that of course we already had the confidential part of the GoArm online system which is only accessible to member states in place and that means that member states already put uh, a lot of the information that we now use in the public part of the database in there in the previous years and that whole infrastructure of um, collecting member states information from um, for the net for the annual national uh, for the annual EU arms export reports was already there so part of this database was let's say relatively easy to make based on the closed quorum online system that we already had in place um, I'll uh, stop here and um, leave you for further deliberation. And if there are any particular questions on the database itself, I'll be happy to answer them, of course. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for this very useful demonstration of a workable, searchable online database on arms exports. I hope you will stay with us for a little bit to answer any questions that might arise. I will also point out that the presentation of the EAS will be uh, posted on the ATT website later. Um, it is very good to see that the EU has made the transition from paper reports to, to a user-friendly online database. Our hope is that your presentation will help participate, uh, participants in their thinking of the scope and parameters for a possible database in the ATT context. We recognize that some delegations have already taken the floor on this subject but would like, and would like to thank them for their input. Uh, we would now like to open the floor to any other participants for questions and comments. Maybe in the meantime, I can ask some technical questions and comments if you would like, uh, if you would allow. Um, two questions that spring to mind in the ATT context is that there is a, a wide variety in reporting, with some uh, countries um, reporting the quantity of goods and some the, uh, the the value of goods. Is that something that you're also facing in the EU? And the second question would be, um, do you also face a problem with non-public reporting or a confidential reporting? How do you deal with that? Uh, thanks, Madam Co-Chair, for, for those questions. Um, um, so I think to be, to, to be brief on, on both, the answer is actually no. Um, I mean, we don't have a variety in reporting because the quorum online system that is being used by all member states is, is one singular system that all uh, member states are used to and that they um, that, that follow a, a certain template and, and uh, there is no way around that, basically. Um, so that it makes indeed, obviously, you know, combining the information from member states, from the EU member states, much easier. If you would go down a similar road in the ATT context, I think uh, at the minimum you would need an agreement on 
what type of data you want from each and single state uh, state party because otherwise indeed you, you know if the information that comes in is is completely uh, going in all kinds of directions then it's uh, difficult to to combine it um, so in in a sense that that problem we don't have although there are some member states that you know have maybe one or two categories of information that is com that that they do not report on but in general we have a full picture uh, from from all the 27 member states uh, regarding the confidentiality so no I mean it's a legal obligation under the common position to uh, to have for each member state to have a national arms export report but also to provide input for the for the combined EU arms export report and this report needs to be publicly available we, that's the whole purpose of it uh, if it would be only for for EU member states, uh, arms licensing officers, then then you would not need such a system. Then you could just send each other the 27 people involved uh, the the relevant data. But the whole purpose, obviously, is for the general public, uh, parliamentarians, NGOs, etc., to to be able to access this information as well. Also, in order to ensure that there is some 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 you know, uh, general support for the decisions that, that the sometimes difficult decision on decisions on arms exports that are being taken. Thank you. I again look around whether there are any delegations wishing to take the floor. Also not online. Um, that means that we can go to the, oh, I see Belgium taking the floor. Belgium, you have the floor. Hello. Thank you um, for your presentation. Yeah. I obviously don't don't, <laughs> don't want to give the impression that only as other <laughs> of the EU member states have questions. But I was I was wondering. Basically, we have a de facto obligation then to use the the database to in, uh, in put our numbers in. But yeah. has there been any member state at some point who has said, "I don't want to use the database. I want to provide my my data on my own template an excel sheet or whatever and would that would that even work that way uh thanks tom for that uh, uh question uh, n no i don't think that's, that's ever happened uh, i wouldn't expect it to happen either um, I think the you know the EU member states are the ones who in, in the end decide on their own um, legally binding common positions also in the context of, of the common foreign and security policy of the EU so that the member states themselves have agreed collectively to report on uh, this matter uh, and, and we use the CORM online system to do that um, nobody's ever complained until now <laughs> but uh, but uh, no so the, to answer your question no that's that's i don't see that happening thank you again uh, i give the floor to poland yeah thank you very much uh, unfortunately i don't have a question regarding uh, mr nagan but to the website um, i would like to draw your attention to a small technical problem faced by poland and concerning access to the restricted part of the website. Namely, they need to reset and change the password uh, every year. And in our opinion, it's, it's a bit tiresome and may cause a confusion. And we would like to, we, it would be grateful if you could consider changing the login process to more uh, user friendly. Thank you. Thank you for that very practical suggestions, which we'll, we will look at. Thank you very much. Any other delegation? No, um, I think that means that we can uh, go to the conclusion of this um, um, meeting. Um, again, we would um, thank the European uh, Oh, I'm sorry, um, the Republic of Korea, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for giving me the floor. The Republic of Korea is deeply concerned about the dropping rate of annual report submission and would like to stress again that the fulfillment of state party reporting obligation is 
essential for transparency and the effective implementation of the treaty. We would like to express our gratitude to WILPF for the presentation. We believe that the presentation is helpful in leaving our measure to improve uh, transparency related to gender and gender-based violence and uh, facilitating the ATT discussions. The Republic of Korea uh, assesses that the FAQ type guidance document on annual reporting obligation could contribute to improving the, uh, the annual report submission rates and effectively implementing the treaty. Uh, moreover, we appreciate the co-chairs tireless work in revising the FAQ type guidance document to uh, incorporated to the revised reporting template. The Republic of Korea believes that uh, uh, such ever online databases will enhance transparency and strengthen treaty implementation. However, we would like to point out that there should be the sufficient discussion on the expected effects, effects and the useful risk of the such ever online database, for example, by leaving the scope of data, accessibility, differentiation from the other database. It would be recommendable to refer to how, how are the such ever online databases, such as the COAM online database are operated. Thank you. Thank you to the Republic of Korea for your intervention. Um, I give the floor to Cameroon. Merci de me passer la parole. Si j'ai bien compris l'exposé, euh, la base de données qu'au ARM est renseignée au bout d'un cycle de 12 mois, Euh, la question que je voudrais poser, c'est de savoir comment cette base pourrait aider un état de transit qui procède à un contrôle sur pièce d'authentifier une licence d'exportation en provenance d'un pays européen, vu que les informations ne sont pas renseignées en temps réel. Et le deuxième aspect, ce serait de savoir, avec autant d'expérience, quelle est l'offre que vous Euh, adresser euh, aux autres États qui ont peut-être besoin d'accompagnement pour euh, euh, structurer des bases de données sur le plan national. Uh, yes, thank you. No, thanks to Cameroon for that question. Um, yes, no, it's, it's true that for, um, you know, real-time information or information on transit licenses, you would have to directly contact uh, an EU member state because, um, indeed, the database is there for mainly for accountability purposes. So you will have the information once a year uploaded uh, around the summertime regarding the previous year. So I understand that if, if, you, ha if, you, if you are looking for, operation, uh, for information for operational reasons, then this database will not you know, help you very much. Uh, you can look up data uh, basically a year after the actual license was issued. Um, so that's probably a bit too late. Um, and so the, the second question was, So, so in terms of, of supporting uh, third countries, we, the EU has, has uh, several outreach projects, which uh, includes the ATT outreach project implemented by the German Export Licensing Authority, BAFA, and the French um, organization Expertise France. Uh, so uh, with, the, with Expertise France, you could definitely be in touch. They have a, a lot of, they are doing already a lot of work in, in, um, in uh, several uh, countries in, in Africa. Um, and I'm sure uh, if, if you want, you know, I can put you in contact with the relevant people. Thank you very much. 
Uh, any other delegation wishing to take the floor? No, I think that, that really was the, 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 the final delegation. Um, we would like to extend our gratitude to the EEAS for sharing your uh, experiences on this matter and to all participants that took the floor in, during the exchange. Um, clearly, there are a lot of questions still to be considered in relation to this topic. Uh, the co-chairs will deliberate, deliberate on how to take it further and will report back in due course. We encourage all stakeholders to reflect on the questions posed in the non-paper for the April meeting in 2021 and share their views in writing and through the online information exchange system. Um, this concludes our final item on the agenda and we can move to closing the meeting. The co-chairs would like to, think, uh, to like, like to thank all the participants that have joined the meeting and to say that we look forward to collaborating with all stakeholders to enhance the work on transparency and reporting in the ATT. And with that, I hand over to the head of the ATT Secretariat for final announcements. Um, I, I thank the coaches for, for giving me the opportunity to speak at this time. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, the, the new coaches of the working group for having successfully facilitated this session. Um, I have uh, two announcements to make um, before we close the session. It's about the side events that are taking place uh, from 14 or oh, from 1630 uh, today after this session. There are two side events that will be taking place. So the first one is organized by Stimson Center as well as the ATT Monitor. It goes under the title Taking Stock of uh, ATT Reporting. The second one is organized by Met, Met for Peace, Development and Human Rights. It uh, goes under the title Implementation of uh, the Arms Trade Treaty. So these side events um, are virtual side events the link to the site events is available on the ATT website under the tech site events. So if you go there, you'll be able to get the link and be able to participate in these uh, site uh, events. We encourage uh, delegates to, to participate in these site events. But they start at uh, 16.30, uh, half past four uh, p.m. up to 6 p.m. Well, the second announcement is just to reiterate what I said at the beginning of uh, this uh, session, uh, that the delegates who have uh, taken the platform and delivered some statements or interventions, if those interventions are in writing and they want them to be posted on the ATT website, um, they can forward those to us um, via the info address of uh, the, the ATT. And equally, um, I also remind the delegates that um, these sessions are recorded. Um, so the recordings of uh, these sessions, the first and the second day, I think they are already available on the ATT website. And of course, uh, for today and uh, tomorrow, we'll do the same. But, uh, but uh, the recordings for today will be available tomorrow. It's not immediately available. So that gives you a chance to have uh, uh, to go through these uh, sessions at your own spare time. Um, I think those are all the comments and announcements that I wanted to make at this point. I hand over to the coaches to close the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was all for today. Um, with that, the session is closed.